Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on the philosophy of Alexander Bard and Jan Sotokvist. These are two contemporary Swedish philosophers who really are doing some of the most important, fascinating, and profound, not to mention entertaining work within the field of philosophy, really within the whole world today. And I cannot recommend enough for you to get a copy of the book's Digital Libido, Sex, Power, and Violence in the Network Society, which we will be discussing in this second video on that text, the first one I had done a few months ago as a kind of more conversational speaking to the webcam sort of video. In this one, we're going to have a more structured and linear um, walk through the text, of course, giving our own response, drawing connections to other thinkers, and really giving you the encouragement to go and get a copy of this book yourself, and uh, really to provide your own response. You should also be doing a video on this book. Uh, we should all be discussing this uh, profound ideas that um, they have uh, both within this book and then later on uh, I'll deal with uh, their book Syntheism, Creating God in the Internet Age. I'd like to remind you that this is a part of the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Link to both my Patreon and Subscribestar accounts in the video description. I also begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor to refute any theories, but rather to consider them from a strictly philosophical perspective. So as I had noted in that more conversational, speaking to the webcam sort of video, responding to the text a few months ago, Sotokovist and Bard basically notice empirically the same thing which Chad Haig himself had noticed, which is that a history can be divided up into phases like the hunter-gatherer, the agrarian, the capitalist slash industrialist slash fossil fuel worldview, and then the era of full-blown technologization. The interesting thing about their interpretation of this basically same division of human history is that whereas for Chad Haig this is strictly ecological in the sense that the um, crucial limiting resource of that society comes to stand as the somatic foundation which is reduplicated into the shape of a deep meme which structures all of the higher order contents such as systems, mythologies, objects, etc. in accord with the geometrical representation of that soma which that deep meme provides for the agrarian world view this is the shape of the circle for the fossil fuel worldview this is the shape of the arrow of progress for the hunter gatherer this is the level plane etc well for um Sotokovist and bard their interpretation of this phenomenon differs slightly in that for them it's really not a matter of the ecological relation to a crucial resource so much as it is a matter of technology primarily the technology of language and this would make sense because the memology if you you will of that worldview, which for them really is the metaphysics. You have a definition of being qua being um, that differs in each of these phases because meaning itself comes to be produced in different ways because the technology of language is what really changes first and then everything else follows after that. So so to put it very briefly, the hunter-gatherer worldview really is defined primarily by the fact that the linguistic technology available at that time for the production of meaning is limited to the spoken word and oral language. You get the agrarian civilization worldview after the technology of language changes to that of the written word, still understood, by the way, in the ancient and medieval sense of uh, manuscripts laboriously copied by hand by a few scribes, really for the religious purposes of a priestly caste. Uh, but still, you get um, a different language technology leading to the production of different kinds of meaning with a whole different metaphysics than would have been possible in the hunter-gatherer worldview. You then get the era of capitalism slash industrialism slash fossil fuel based progress with its very different metaphysics after the technology of language changes to that of the Gutenbergian printing press, in which case so many more texts can be produced so much more rapidly as to make the Cartesian thinker seem to be uh, the uh, definition of humanity in and of itself, whereas it's really just the extension of the privilege of literacy to far more people within society as a matter of um, the kind of technological conditions which one has found oneself living under after the invention of the printing press. But of course, that era has itself been supplanted now by a different uh, metaphysics in a different shape of time because the technology of language available with the rise of the internet is no longer that merely of the Gutenbergian printing press, but is instead the digital 
um, and informationalist technology of language that we are still only barely beginning to catch up with conceptualizing on a metaphysical level. One of the tasks of this book will be to flesh out how exactly the metaphysics of the informationalist age differ from so many of the things we take for granted as being relevant to, say, the critique of capitalism, or in the case of Hague, the critique of fossil fuel-based progress. All of that actually is kind of out of date now, and that is what makes this such a fascinating text. And so as we get into the text itself, you may have noticed that Bard and Soderkvist tend to like to open at least some of their books with a meditation on the paradox um, that we humans need meaning to exist, uh, but the problem is that meaning simply cannot exist, at least not in the same way that the saucepan hanging over the kitchen stove exists, uh, to use their own favorite example. This, of course, really is just another way of talking about the Heideggerian distinction between the ontological and the ontic. This is the idea that meaning does exist, but only in the sense that it has to deal with Dasein's disclosure of existence as a clearing of hermeneutical understanding in terms of the mysterious structures of time, rather than have much to do with the kind of existence you have when you're talking about the ontic notion of an object, or um, in German it's clear, a Gegenstand, that's what you were standing over against, um, which could be rendered present at hand, to use the Heideggerian terminology, um, and it could be observed in accord with the traditional categories of Aristotelian thought, but all of that is merely an abstraction away from its more primordial givenness as something ready at hand as equipment within a referential totality of involvement. So the paradox, once again, is we need meaning to exist, but meaning cannot exist in the same way, the ontic way that the latter Gegenstein does. It really has more to do with the mysteries of interpretation, or to use their own terminologies, of meaning production relevant to language. Well, in digital libido, this recurring theme that um, we need meaning to exist, even though meaning does not exist, in the same way that mundane physical objects do. Well, this is exemplified uh, particularly memorably, memorably at the beginning of the book when they kind of just cut to the chase of showing this through the humorous example of that object which would seem to be um, uniquely obvious in its, in its meaning, which is um, that of bared breasts. Now, bared breasts might seem to have a meaning so obvious as to transcend the paradoxes of Heideggerian ontological difference, but if you really think about it, these same bared breasts might mean something very different depending on the context in which they appear. So you might think that obviously they just mean a whole lot of fun, but these same bared breasts could appear as the exact opposite of fun in something like, say, a strict religious community with modesty laws, which would cause these same bared breasts to appear as a dangerous phenomenon associated with the risk of punishment, and therefore something to be run away from if they appeared in that world. But what if they were to appear in a place in which you're allowed to look, there's a no prohibition stopping you from doing so, uh, but where the privilege to look doesn't really entail very much fun. Think of a nudist colony filled with people who you would actually prefer to see fully clothed, as one rock star noted after having to play a concert for just such a community. But what if these breasts appeared in a place where you actually had a perverse duty to have to look at them, like in a strip club in which you'd be violating the rules of the place precisely if you did not take the opportunity to look, because that would mean you were wasting the hard-earned money you had paid to be there by not paying attention to the show. This super-ego demand forcing you to look at those bared breasts, however, is paradoxically much less fun than if you felt like you were sneaking around the rules to do it from your own volition. The question naturally arises then, how there could be so many different meanings, even for that most animalistically basic phenomenon of bared breasts, unless meaning itself comes to exist not in a vacuum, but only as the result of a very subtle battle for power over the production of meaning to use the terms of the authors themselves. Well, this is a battle which they tell us from the start, quote unquote, still rages with undiminished force. And the reason for that is that the production of meaning is not only a matter of technology and language, as I had noted at the beginning of this video, but also of desire. The problem, of course, is that in the aftermath of Freud, it is no longer possible to simply speak of desire without any further qualification. 
for the death drive has complicated our understanding of desire by showing that it's really more like a duality of two rather different forces. You do have the libido on the one hand, but then you also have the mortido on the other. And this book really focuses on the reasons why the mortido has always disrupted our attempts to liberate the libido through simply de-repressing society into a state of perfect happiness. Really, that is the story of modernity. We've tried to remove the prohibitions of the past, but it somehow has not led to a utopian society, but rather to something which has flopped very badly despite basically following the same sort of theoretical framework provided within Freud's civilization and its discontents only in an inverted form. You might recall from Freud's civilization and its discontents that Freud noted that repression of sexual desire is actually a condition which is required for complex civilizations because all of the energy which would be wasted on solipsistic pursuits of sexual pleasure for the individual can instead be redirected into hard labor which benefits the collective whole of society by building up the kind of infrastructure structure you need to have the kind of material comfort and technological sophistication of a modern society. Well, the funny thing about this is that even Freud's description of this sort of redirection of sexual energy into productive labor is itself actually pretty much obsolete from the 1950s onward. One critical theorist named uh, Marcuse noted that from the 1950s on, it's no longer really necessary to force people to repress their way into material prosperity because fossil fuels have provided enough free energy that human labor is no longer as necessary as it used to be, while automation and artificial intelligence have made it possible for machines to do enough labor that humans eventually will have no job except to consume enough to keep the global economy functioning. The problem, though, is that this promise of the body which could be liberated for no purpose except to be enjoyed is really just the psychoanalytic equivalent of the communist idea of a classless society. That is to say, it is the ideal endpoint of the dialectic of history itself. The question, of course, is why the end of history has still failed to arrive just as badly in the Freudian um, interpretation as it has in the Marxist. We know all too well as people from the West that the campaign of sexual derepression and technological automation as basically enabling one another has not led to a state of perfect happiness. Rather, it has created a society with an epidemic of addiction, depression, and suicide. This is especially prominent in those nations that would seem to be the front runners of progress. Now, Bard and Sotokovist explained that this libidinal paradise described by Marcuse is something which not only never has, but actually never could exist. This is because any talk of it really is just the Rousseauian fantasy of a promise to the return to the conditions of the noble savage in disguise. As you see, the fantasy of derepressing our way into a utopia makes the error of assuming that we can somehow turn back the hands of time to return to the state of happiness which we supposedly have before we ever met le nom du père. You might know from Lacanian theory that this is a play on words in French referring both to the name of the father, that is to say the beginning of language and naming, and also for the no of the father or the prohibitions of civilization. Well, the error made here is the idea that you can go back to the time before language and civilization precisely in order to create the ideal civilization with the ideal meanings, which we know, of course, actually come through the production of meaning through a technology of language. Well, this is a paradox, this is a contradiction, rather, which is all too easy to miss if you only think of desire in terms of the libido or what might naively be thought of as a life drive. It is something which is proven to be impossible when you take into account the fact that desire is also the mortido or the death drive. More um, specifically, the Rousseauian fantasy is proven to be 
hopelessly incompatible with the way that the Mortito or death drive functions because the thing which is desired in the death drive is not a return to the state which one had at birth or shortly after birth, that is to say, at some innocent period of one's life uh, before Le Nom du Père intruded. Rather, the death drive is oriented towards something which goes beyond life altogether, because the thing which the death drive really focuses on, albeit in a very repressed manner, is the original trauma of having been born in the first place. The death drive really is just our way of expressing or perhaps repressing the regret we had that we ever had been put into this dreaded place called life in the first place. Likewise, the paradox of repression is that it's not just the negative obstacle standing in the way of our desire's self-realization. Rather, the prohibition or the repression is precisely the positive condition which allows those desires to exist in the first place. This book, then, will explain the history of the world in terms of the battle for the production of meaning, with due recognition given to the roles of technology, language, and also to a desire which is both libidinal and mortidinal. In the second chapter, titled Human Constant, Technological Variable, and Metahistorical Tsunami, Bart and Sotokovist return once again to the Heideggerian paradox that we, we need meaning to exist, even though meaning simply cannot exist in the same way that the saucepan hanging in the kitchen does. In this chapter, however, rather than just focus on the Heideggerian uh, phenomenological and existentialist interpretation of the difference between the ontic and the ontological, um, Bart and Sotokovist actually provide some theories from the more quote-unquote hard sciences to explain why this is the case. They tell us that evolutionary biology has revealed that the need for meaning is actually a remnant of a much older instinct to ascribe or project causes and the presences of intelligences even where they might not really exist. This was because if you're living in really wild conditions, Natural selection would tend to reward those who were too cautious and punish those who were not cautious enough. For example, if you assume that there's a snake or a wolf around the corner when you're actually living in the forest, um, you'll be less likely to be surprised those times when there actually is one waiting there. If you're completely careless in such conditions, you always assume that there's not a snake or wolf, then you're probably not going to survive for very long in such a context. Well, the search for meaning therefore, paradoxically, is in and of itself meaningless. Or be, to be more precise, meaning only ever emerges secondarily as a side effect of some more primordial processes, which we know now to be those of repression and narrativization. However, meaning is only recognized as such if it is also shared by others. So this repression and narrativization have to be done on a collective scale, which means that they have to be historical and ideological at their very core. Well, the authors claim that history is always ideological in the sense that this narrativization is always selectively performed. The account of how the present came to be never even tries to be objective or unbiased, for it always serves the political function of reduplicating an unstated power struggle into a form which comes to stand as the very definition of the meaning which we are all hardwired to be searching for. A great example of this is the fact that there simply was no word for the Stone Age before the Industrial Revolution, for it was only in comparison with fossil fuel-based technological progress that the vastly distant past had to be portrayed in such crudely primitive caricatures. The problem is that even if one tries to just cut the BS and see things as they really are, quote unquote, one won't really gain anything from doing that, because the way things really are, with all of the ideological narrativization subtracted out of the picture, would simply be a chaos. The reason why that chaotic flux of noise is never emphasized by anyone is because no existing power structure's interests would be served by calling our attention to it. In other words, as the authors say themselves, the metaphysical order 
always bolsters the political order. Now, of course, we all rationally understand that the political rulers and the uh, business interests who occupy the real estate at the very top of the social hierarchy don't really deserve the privilege which they have, for their success was more the result of winning a certain historical lottery than anything else. But even if the state of affairs which gave them that privilege might be totally contingent, this is still reified into a code of moral values endowed with the illusion of an eternal and a priori validity. Or to put it in the Hegelian terms, necessity is only ever ascribed after the fact and only ever by man. Existence itself is pointlessly contingent. But even if we grant that meaning is created secondarily through processes of historicization which are never disinterested, the question for this book is what role the libido might play in all of this. Well, this is a very complicated matter because of the Nietzschean will to power is libidinal in that it is a need for freedom, but the slave mentality is mortidinal, or defined by the death drive. However, the story of history is that libido can switch to mortido as a result of our hardwired resistance to change. This is something which is actually much worse for the elites who are nested within the deepest layers of the existing power structure, for they will cling to an old and outdated model even to the point of literal death, in a particularly shocking reversal from their libidinal drive for freedom into its exact opposite, which is the mortidinal enslavement to the same old narrative which they just happen to have personally benefited from the most. Well, this has been the story throughout history, but modern digital conditions actually do open up a whole new window to rewrite that narrative and the corresponding power structures. This is because of a shift in technology itself, but specifically, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, in regard to the technology of language, which, by the way, is the most accurate description of what digital media really is. Understood in these terms, the new paradigm which we are living under is no longer capitalist, as is erroneously thought, is rather informationalist. To understand what that means, we must, though, first examine Bard and Sotokovic's theory of the dialectic of technology and man. To put it very briefly, this is the theory that a technological change happens first, and then a new metaphysics trails after. An excellent example of this is the way that Descartes' philosophy, centered around the individual as a rational thinker and questioner, did not occur in a vacuum. It had to have followed after the technology of Gutenberg's printing press. This invention is singled out as uniquely important by Bart and Sotokvist because it directly altered the way that language itself happens for humans by giving us mass-produced, easily copied printed text as something radically different from the kind of manuscripts which were laboriously copied by hand by monks within monasteries, ultimately for the purposes of a tiny class of elite, literate, religious priests let alone the purely spoken word of tribal societies, which was even more radically different from the printed word than that. The Gutenbergian printing press changed the meaning of the metaphysical notion of being itself because it changed the way that meaning is produced. It is clear, then, why the latter had to happen before the former could, for Descartes could define man as a thinking thing or res cogitans, only after so many more texts had become physically accessible to so many more people within the population as to make scholarly activity seem to be the universal definition of human nature itself rather than a privilege restricted to a tiny class of religious priests. It is crucial to note, however, that because all of this unfolds as a historical process, the temporal gap between a technological shift and the metaphysical interpretation of it might actually be centuries in length, as was the case for Descartes and Gutenberg. There was a few centuries between them, wasn't there? Well, before the metaphysics can fully catch up with the technology, the resulting vacuum of meaning might be experienced as a chaos for those caught up on the ground level. We ourselves, however, are living through just such a shift as the rise of internet started in the 1980s, which was decades ago, but is something which we are still only beginning to start to conceptualize this 
uh, many years later. And of course, for most of his, most of us, the internet still is just experienced as a chaos, as most people just exist in a state of flux, leaping from one meaningless social media post to another, granting less than a millisecond's worth of attention to each one of them. Likewise, we can see how this historical uh, transition has worked as a completed process only through looking back in the past to reconstruct these four phases in retrospect. The first was defined by the linguistic technology of spoken language, as I noted near the beginning of this video. The corresponding sociological structure for the linguistic technology of the spoken word was the primitivist um, cultures of tribal hunter-gatherers. The second phase was defined by the linguistic technology of written language in the sense of, once again, very rare manuscripts laboriously copied by hand by scribes and monks. The corresponding sociological structure was feudalism, while the corresponding metaphysics centered around the god of monotheism, while the third phase was defined by the linguistic technology of the Gutenbergian printing press with the corresponding sociological structure of capitalism and the corresponding metaphysics personified into the Cartesian individual. The fourth phase, which we are currently living under now, despite the fact that we're only beginning to catch up with it, is defined by the linguistic technology of the internet with the corresponding social structure of informationalism, and as we shall deal with later on, the metaphysical temporality of the event. Now, interestingly, one thing which can be said is that even though there is a time gap between the introduction of a new technology of language and the arrival of its corresponding political and metaphysical interpretation, this time gap actually has gotten shorter and shorter with each successive leap. You might compare the invention of the Gutenbergian printing press to the arrival of capitalism as a fully fleshed out economic structure. Well, it was about 350 years between those two events. Well, the shift from the invention of the internet to the rise of a fully informationalist society is, needless to say, going to be much shorter, although this transition is still far from complete. However, it is also important to note that it is not quite as simple as just saying that one paradigm replaces another in a clean-cut manner. For even to the present day, we still retain many of the hunter-gatherer brain conditions which had defined the vast majority of human evolution. The irony which anarcho-primitivists like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Jean Zerzan miss, however, in their tribal nostalgic fantasies, is that it is these same hunter-gatherer brain conditions which enable us to commit the same forms of violence and crimes against the other, which they tell us can be resolved if we just turn back the hands of time to go back to uh, the conditions of uh, that existed before the agricultural revolution. The reason for this is actually quite simple. If tribalism only has about enough conceptual real estate space in the brain to account for about 150 people who are understood to really belong to the uh, hunter-gatherer band which we are a part of, well, even in the era of grotesque global overpopulation, it'll naturally follow that the number of people I can conceptualize as really belonging to my world will remain about that small. Despite the fact that billions of people exist, only about 150 of them are really acknowledged by me to be real. So tribalism was, historically speaking, the most violent, not the most peaceful. And that is because, once again, anyone outside the 150 onto the half-filled lifeboat off the Titanic is not even really human. Warfare follows precisely from that fact, for I can only kill them if they're completely anonymous and faceless to me. Zerzan loves to blame agriculture for the creation of war, but actually war continues to be possible for us only because it has existed from the time of primitivism itself.
So in the third chapter of the book titled From the Plastic Nomadic Tribe to the Global Empire, Bard and Sotokovist note that the really interesting thing about primitivist living conditions is um, that these are conditions in which surpluses are basically impossible. This is true both on a material and, as we'll get to in a moment, on a symbolic level. We'll start with the material. Uh, because there is no way to store food in hunter-gatherer conditions, um, it has to be eaten right away. This leads to the kind of social egalitarianism which is celebrated by someone like John on because it's just impossible for one person to build up the kinds of surpluses of material wealth which lead to the kind of grotesque social inequality you see in the world today. That is true, but on a more basic level than that, this means that um, there's simply no point in doing extra work. The expectation of, say, Silicon Valley that you have to be ultra-productive all the time, well, that really isn't possible in the hunter-gatherer worldview because the time when you can't work is time you realize should be spent doing things like, say, playing games. Similarly, the linguistic technology of oral language leaves no place to store knowledge because you don't have writing. In fact, the only place you can store that knowledge is in the human brain, and particularly in the brain of the elder who has had the most years to learn really, in that context, the most stories. That's the kind of knowledge which is valued the most. Well, this might provide the explanation for why exactly it is that human beings can live several decades after losing their reproductive viability because they can still serve a very important function as the storehouse of knowledge. But on a political level, the fact that the patriarch has a storehouse of knowledge within his own brain means that nobody else can access that knowledge without his explicit cooperation. There's not an archive of written manuscripts which are available on an impersonal and anonymous basis to whoever, whoever happens to uh, break into the, um, the library where they're all stored. Rather, you have to have the consent of a person who therefore develops something like an unquestionable power structure within the tribe for which you're not even allowed to ask about its origin. Bard and Soderqvist claim that the mythological archetype of the hero originally emerged from people's need to identify with somebody who was not himself that patriarch as the hero tended to be a young man whose strength and daring provided a, a nice contrast with the senile tribal elder, even if the latter was oftentimes his own father. On a properly religious level, though, when the patriarch archetype is projected out into the forces of nature itself, you get your first gods. As I return to later, we usually think of a polytheism as an agrarian phenomenon, but actually, the truest polytheism was just this projection of the tribal elders' privilege into the forces of nature that you find in the hunter-gatherer worldview, in which the plurality of animals, plants, meteorological forces, even things like the sun, and the moon, all of those were understood to be personifications of the same sort of storehouse of knowledge which the tribal elder was able to be simply as a result of the kind of linguistic technology which defined that sociological phase of human history. In fact, you'll notice that monotheism really was the religion of the literate elite during the agrarian worldview, in contrast with the polytheistic folk and home religions of the lower class masses during the same era. Evidencing the tendency for the dominant metaphysics of the previous era to resurface as the religion of the lower class masses in the next. You saw the same thing really in the capitalist era as the factory worker underclass was largely affiliated with the kind of monotheism you had surviving in the form of Protestant Christianity. This, by the way, was the foundation even of Engels' re-envisioning of the second coming of Christ as the communist revolution itself. It's important to note, though, that there is, strictly speaking, no way to reverse this process and actually reinstate that nostalgically longed-for worldview of the past. You'll notice that all previous attempts to ban the new technology which accounted for this shift of power have all ended in failures about as embarrassing as Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich's pathetic campaign to try to stop people from downloading music on the internet as he was um, uh, uh, waging a war against 
Napster all the way back in the early 2000s, very similar to the Vatican's futile attempts to stop the printing press from copying books centuries ago. As Bard and Soderqvist correctly note, the only solution to the problem of internet music piracy was to just go legit with it by creating a new technology for what was once a taboo activity, but one which, let's face it, everybody does. That technology was called streaming. At this point, Spotify and YouTube virtually are the only ways people consume music. Against the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski, then, Bard and Soderqvist argue that undoing a technology, let alone destroying the entire globe-spanning technological system is not a realistic option. The only hope one can have for constructive change is to modify the technology from within its own coordinates. In the 10th chapter of the book titled Socioanalysis as the Critical Theory of the Internet Age, Barn and Soderqvist clarify how the search for meaning can be carried out by going beyond the Heideggerian interpretation of this problem, instead proposing an original theory of the individual and its identity. But wait a minute, what is a individual? That sounds a little bit like the term which you would get if you simply chopped off the beginning of the word individual, and indeed that is what it is. The individual for Bard and Soderkvist never was anything except a metaphysical construct correlated to the Gutenbergian printing press the capitalist economic order, and the philosophy of Cartesianism. Now that that era has been supplanted by the internet and the informationalist metaphysics, we can no longer think of ourselves as independent rational thinkers and questioners, but must instead recognize that we are individuals whose identity is defined relationally through the interplay of both self-image and collective worldview, which are actually always two sides of the same coin. Just as there is no world without self, so too there is no self without world, which is just another way of saying that it's all dialectical. Likewise, Bard and Soderqvist propose that we go beyond psychoanalysis, which is the study of the production of individually psychological identity, to instead study socioanalysis or the production of the individually relational sociological identity. The paradigm shift from capitalism to informationalism, which makes this emphasis on the individual rather than the individual possible for the first time in history, must, however, be understood in terms of the four phases which every such paradigm shift must pass through. As noted earlier, first a technological revolution occurs principally with regard to the technology of language, for that is what has the greatest implications for the means by which meaning might be produced as the secondary effect of underlying power struggles and dialectical relations. Afterwards, you get the second phase in which new ideas try to catch up with that technological leap through creating a new metaphysics that hopes to redefine our answers to those ultimate questions of being. It bears mentioning that this new metaphysics is inherently ideological in the sense that its claims are empirically unverifiable because the real point here is to provide a meta-narrative explaining why exactly it is that those who happen to hold power in this new arrangement are precisely the people who should hold power on moral or religious grounds. A great example of this is that the urban bourgeoisie empowered by the printing press were granted enormous privilege under the resultant capitalist economic order, but no longer had any need for the feudal era idea of the single god of monotheism. They instead favored its equivalent as their own self-image qua the Cartesian individual, resulting in the heroic archetype of Napoleon and the religion of humanism. This is all long out of date now, however, as the rise of informationalism favors a metaphysical idea centered around the net, or the ideal that networkizing or forming individually relation, uh, relational connections as quickly and ef as efficiently as possible is what really matters in the context we are living through now. So too the shape of time denoted by the capitalist era myth of progress is also long since out of date, as Bard and Sordekovist notify us on page 87, if you have your own copy of the text, that it has already been supplanted by the shape of time concentrated in the idealized event. This is the network dynamical peak experience followed by the transformative memory of the same. 
So to quickly review the four metaphysical phases, uh, the metaphysics of the spoken word has the mythical personifications of the primordial mother and father who really reduplicate the privileged role of the tribal elder into so many gods and goddesses personified into the forces of wild nature. The metaphysics of the written word holds the shape of time denoted by eternity, really the eternity of the heaven beyond this one and the mythical personification of the one god of monotheism who lives there. The metaphysics of the printed word holds the shape of time denoted by the arrow of progress and the mythical personification of the self-worshipping Cartesian individual. Finally, the metaphysics of the informationalist net holds the shape of time denoted by the event and the mythical personification of the relationally and dialectically defined individual. One of the most humorous conclusions drawn from seeing this historical succession spelled out in explicit detail for the first time ever is just how much the Nietzschean death of God is really, really old news at this point. The big news story today is how the net has ushered in the death of the Cartesian individual in much the same way that Nietzsche proclaimed the death of God over a century ago. Well, along with the Cartesian individual will disappear the surrogates created in his image. For example, the science of atomism was, in retrospect, just an attempt to understand nature in Cartesianly individual terms, just as politics had nationalism for just the same Cartesian-ish reason. Now, to return to the set of phases, in the third phase, you find a great chaos in which the full uh, power of the new technology is released and the older structures are visibly dissolved as a result. It is all too easy, however, to mistake this chaos for the revolution itself, but that had already occurred much earlier, and the two really are distinct events. If you want proof of this, just look at the way that the French Revolution followed centuries after the invention of the Guten Bergian printing press, but it followed in time precisely as a logical result of the latter technologies having made it impossible for the Catholic Church and the French monarchy to maintain the same kind of power which they had enjoyed in the feudalistic times of the Middle Ages. Well, given that the new order operates under different laws of natural selection than the order it had replaced, it goes without saying that different types of people and different types of behaviors will be favored to win in the new arrangement, which leads to the fourth phase, in which a new rising class will structure the new chaos into a whole new order, and then they'll retroactively narrativize that order into an ideology which reflects that um, new social uh, position's legitimacy on moral, religious, or philosophical grounds. In the process, of course, they obscure the technological origins which really accounted for their privilege, but then again, that's the entire point. Interestingly, after this restructuring is completed, the new underclass it does not identify with the ideology of the new elites, but as I mentioned before, they continue to live in the past. The factory workers of the capitalist era continue to uphold the monotheism, which was the religion of the elites in the agrarian worldview, especially um, through maintaining the kind of Protestant Christianity which made the Marxist promise of the second coming of Christ so easy for them in the form of communism, that is to say, uh, so easy for them to understand. Well, you find the same thing in the previous era. The medieval peasants of the agrarian worldview actually still practice polytheism under another name. The real polytheism, once again, was uh, that of uh, the hunter-gatherer worldview, which projected the figure of the tribal patriarch into so many forces of nature, but this survived into the agrarian worldview under the fraudulent banner of, say, having so many patron saints for different causes that you could make uh, intercessory prayers to or go on pilgrimage to see, you know, remnants and relics of their body, like, oh, here's the head of John the Baptist, I can um, get some sort of a favor and response for traveling across Europe to one of three locations that claims to have a head belonging to John the Baptist, but never mind that. Well, my own personal theory is that you see the same thing continuing into the present day, even though it's not spelled out in the book as such. I think that libertarians today are doing the same thing. They're celebrating the informationalist 
era of the internet as providing the ideal technological conditions to allow the Cartesian individual the kind of freedom which wouldn't have even been possible in the capitalist era. We call this anarcho-capitalism as the kind of utopia which allows personal freedom and liberty without realizing that digitalization and globalization have changed the terms yet again to make the very idea of the individual into a hopelessly outdated metaphysical presupposition of the Gutenbergian past. Well, Bard and Soderqvist warned that this sort of tragic nostalgia actually is the most dangerous thing because in Freudian terms, this is just the absent phallus syndrome in disguise. It is, in other words, a falling back on an earlier previously established meaning simply because it's so much easier than meeting the demands of real phallic creation of meaning here and now. Informationalism has nothing to do with the libertarian individual, for digitalization is all about globalization and nodalization, in which the new power structures are not formed between single individual people, but rather between collective networks. This is more concretely the relation of whole internet subcultures to one another. You might have noticed how it's the subcultures today which are taking on a life of their own, but remain unequal in regard to how much power they have within the cybersphere, uh, because some internet subcultures effectively influence nobody, while others influence millions. In the fifth chapter of the book, titled Instinct, Drive, Desire, and Transcendence, Bard and Soderkivist note that we organisms inherently don't like change, but because of the nature of reality, change is always being imposed on us anyway. This aversion to change, however, goes really all the way back to the very beginning of our lives, since once again the Freudian death drive is the original desire we had to go back to the state of no changes, in the sense that it is the desire to go back to the time before we were born into this world. As soon as we are born, we kind of regret that sorry state of affairs we found ourselves in, and we search for some way to crawl back into a second womb all over again. This hypothetical place where change never happens to us, of course, really is just a euphemism for the lifeless matter which we hope to return to after death, but in various metaphysical and religious formulations, it comes to be, uh, be seen as, say, the heaven of monotheistic religion, the world of ideas of Platonism, or the, um, uh, the uh, spiritual force of Brahman, which the Hindu hopes to merge with by escaping the cycle of birth and rebirth by getting out of the wheel of reincarnations. Because the wish to reverse the great trauma of birth is all of our first desire, the libido actually is just a secondary repression of this more primordial death drive, or libido. Desiring to live, then, is always a perverse repression of the original desire to unlive oneself. This provides the terms for a duality between the libidinal understood in phallic terms and the mortidinal understood in terms of the maternal matrix, which can themselves be correlated with a culture understood to be masculine and nature understood to be feminine, though of course we do not mean this in literal terms of, say, biological sex or even gender. The matrix represents the coherence of the second womb and the identity of nature, while the phallus represents the separation of language because, as you might recall from a Saussurean standpoint, meaning is only ever generated through differentiation. In Saussurean linguistics, we never know what any symbol means positively in and of itself. We only know that a given symbol is different from the other symbols in that same language. So the origin of meaning is inherently differential and negative. Or to use the Zizekian terms, the matrix is imaginary while the phallus is symbolic. In addition, though, Julia Kristeva showed us that the child is maybe separated from the mother at the moment of birth, but only comes to be fully abjected from the mother at about age one. That is the age when sexual difference is discovered after the child recognizes that the mother does not have 
the phallus. This is when the fear of castration sets in, as the child realizes he could also lose the phallus. But this is also when language, and hence meaning, become possible, because the primordial sexual difference discovered at this moment provides the transcendental condition for the Saussurian differentiation of the many signifiers of the symbolic order to generate meaning as the side effect of their interplay with one another. Although one can eventually reach a state of maturity in which a more or less healthy balance is restored between these two, they can't ever fully be united, let alone turn the universe into a harmonious whole, because they're always disrupted by a third thing, which is called the real. We now find out the reason why meaning must exist, even though it can't exist. The answer is that unity is an attribute of the ontically given saucepan, but is strictly missing from the ontological disclosure of the world. This is because the levels of real, symbolic, and imaginary can never be united into a one. In the sixth chapter of the book, titled The Dialectics of Libido and Mortido, we return to the paradox that all attempts to de-repress society into a utopian state have failed so miserably, but we realize now that the funny thing about the prohibitions which they suspended is that, on the one hand, they immediately generate the desire to prohibit them, but if nothing is prohibited for that reason, desire paradoxically vanishes or no longer functions normally. Well, the experiment in which all prohibitions are suspended uh, with the resulting effects on desire all too visible is actually something which we can observe on the ground level right now. That place where nothing is prohibited is just called the internet. The internet has allowed this suspension of all prohibitions through, on the one hand, allowing users full anonymity, but has also provided an archive of so many millions of shockingly taboo posts which can be accessed largely for free, uh, but the result has not been the de-repression of society into a perfectly functional and happy state. Instead, just as inflation devalues the currency of a nation into effectively having no value at all, Bard and Sodakovists apparently coined the term pornoflation to describe the way that the internet's easy access to a never-ending stream of ever more extreme content has only ended up killing the libido of desire along with the superego that once restricted it. Now, the funny thing is that desire and its prohibition once again have a dialectical relation in which one needs the other. As a result, the only desire one really does have left today is the desire for the one thing which the internet simply cannot give, which is attention. We all know that the only point of using social media is attention-seeking for its own sake, but this attention is so highly valued precisely because it is also made impossible by the same technology, because one's attention span is eroded by the internet into effectively a state of nothingness. It induces one to demand the same impossible-to-give attention from everybody else. Capitalism, then, has long since been replaced by attentionalism, as the most valuable thing is no longer tangible material wealth. Instead, it is attention. This is what people crave in the internet, but also what they can no longer give in large amounts precisely because the technology of the internet has destroyed their attention span. In the eighth chapter of the book, titled In Search of the Last Phallus in the Digital Plutocracy, we find that shifting emphasis from the individual to the collective internet subculture reveals the internet age to be the exact opposite of anything democratic. It is instead, quote-unquote, a plutocratic battle of various nodes in a flattened chaos, as the authors themselves put it. This is exactly how things have to be in the informationalist era, because nodal distantiation increases the libido while providing an incentive against things like mutual comprehension or cooperation. A great example of this is cryptocurrency itself. This is a form of money that erodes the state's power through reducing its ability to practice taxation in a transparent or universal manner. Nick Land, of course, celebrates this decentralization through cryptocurrency as supposedly inevitably leading to a libertarian or anarcho-capitalist future, but Bard and Sotokovist 
place a greater emphasis on its implications for the collective by noting that the result is just the kind of fragmentation into various subcultures which we're already witnessing today. The irony, however, is that the internet's rampant decentralization has also created a perverse incentive for order to be valued even more highly than it had been in previous eras. This is for the simple reason that the internet allows so much information output to reach our senses that any ordering of that which even tries to meet that gigantic demand halfway becomes more important precisely because it holds an intangible and phallic character ultimately, in the sense that the symbolic order's purely abstract generation of meaning through the differentiation of those Sosorian signifiers is now literally more valuable than the ownership of tangible material goods. The phallus is relevant here in the sense of being the exact opposite of the nostalgic desire to unbirth oneself by crawling back into the second womb of some new mother. Instead, the phallus concerns a fascination with the creation of meaning through difference, which does take one in a whole different direction than simply going backwards to the state of being unborn. This phallic creation of symbolic meaning is, even even more valuable in the context of the internet, though, for the latter might be thought of as the ultimate infantilization of humans. It allows them to reabsorb themselves into an idiotic pleasure of feeding at a new pseudo-breast, which never stops dispensing an utterly unphallic chaos and excess of unstructured content to them. Under these conditions, Phallic order only arrives much later and largely from the affirmative will to power that might seize the higher ground to create its own values in a properly Nietzschean sense. This is particularly true when one realizes that the main thing one is trying to suck up from the pseudo-breast of the internet is just, as I mentioned, attention, since social media is a strangely lonely place where you speak endlessly to hundreds or thousands of people, but nobody actually listens. This only makes sense, though, for the internet has trained us to think that something better can be obtained with just one more click, so there's really no reason to keep looking at your social media profile or your post for more than the nanosecond that they happen to appear in my newsfeed as I'm frantically scrolling down to find something more interesting than you. As Bard and Soderqvist go on to reference studies proving that the printed word actually is correlated psychologically with longer attention spans in its readers, this really does make sense for the printed word is inherently more phallic because it is structurally more ordered than the chaotic flux of noise which the internet has already devolved into. The internet is therefore strangely lacking in the phallus, despite being the place where pornoflation has has made the sight of graphic nudity so commonplace as to cease to be either shocking or even interesting. The phallus is therefore now more important than it ever has been because the internet is the ultimate return to the womb of passive pleasures qua the illusion that one is getting attention from an audience that doesn't actually exist. In the 12th chapter, we find that the supreme example of a non-phallic, meaningless absorption into the pseudo-breast of internet-based attention-seeking is, of course, the SJW movement. SJWism does nothing except hold an endless contest asking which group is the most victimized, but never offers any solution for this victimization except to lower everybody else into the state of being equally guilty just for existing. This is the exact opposite of any phallic ideal of l elevating the hero's libidinal creation of meaning to the sense of establishing that which we're all really searching for, for the Heideggerian reasons noted at the very beginning of the book. But the sociological implications are also easy enough to see. As the rise of civilization is always libidinal and phallic in nature, while the decline of civilization is always the mortidinal retreat into the second womb, 
as an expression of the death drive. Because ne uh, decline negates symbolic meaning, it makes all of us less subjective by actively discouraging us from ever growing up. It's because leaving the breast for the phallus is now not only optional, it's actually against what the system really wants. The order is for us to just eat and entertain ourselves to death, but that can only be understood if we place the greatest emphasis on the last two words of that imperative. In the 13th chapter, he notes that Peter Pan syndrome, or the desire to never grow up and live as a child for one's entire life, has actually now been mandated as welfare, obesity, etc. are things which the system is actually pushing on us, rather than things which we have to sneak around them and violate the prohibitions to engage in. These are all, though, just signs of the informationalist age's infantilization of the masses, creating the most flattened and horizontal society that has ever existed without, however, giving any noticeable harmony or unity to it, as this society is actually more divided than any that has ever existed before. On a purely technological level, though, this state of affairs thwarts our expectations because the strange irony here is that we actually do, for the first time in history, all have equal access to things like, say, super sophisticated devices like smartphones. Also, we have an equalization in how we spend our time. No matter who you might be, you're pretty much always online and pretty much always checking your own social media profile. Kendall Jenner, one of the um, sisters of the Kardashian family, famously quit Instagram in, say, 2015 because it was wasting too much of her time, only to come back one week later noting that she was already back to her daily routine of waking up in the morning and grabbing her phone before anything else to see if she got any notifications. No matter how wealthy you might be, these divisions have been leveled, but the division between the powerful and the powerless is more pronounced than it ever has been. This is because automation has disempowered the masses by making them incapable of actually working, while those who do wield real influence, not in the sense of some dumbass on TikTok who dances for 30 seconds for an audience of bots, but really uh, people who exercise influence behind the scenes actually remain behind the scenes by disappearing into a kind of invisibility and silence not seen at any time before in history. You can contrast this with the all too visible displays of public power wielded by the industrialists of the 19th century, by the kings of the Middle Ages, or by the patriarchs of tribal societies, and you'll find that the kind of elites who hold the power today are people who actually, for the first time in history, would have nothing to gain from making their presence visible to somebody like you. This only makes it harder, though, for the masses to actually understand the world that they live in, for the most significant and influential events that take place are precisely the ones which the news will not ever report on. In the 15th section, we find that the political implications of these historical conditions are inherently anti-democratic, because democracy only ever seemed to be necessary in the time when people still had to formally tell the system what they wanted through voting. But now that the technology is such that it already knows what people really want, um, rather than what they'll openly say they want, uh, because the system already has all of their search history online archived. Well, um, if you want a concrete example of what sort of political order will result from this state of affairs, all you have to do is look at China. Communist China already does something like what the global technological system is going to do in the future, in that it gives people what they really should want, rather than bother asking them what they'll say they want in voting. This is why elections are no re longer really a thing over there. So too, the dictatorship of technology will be a lot more like that than the sort of anarcho capitalist fantasies, which are prominent among figures um, like, say, Stefan Molyneux or Sticks Hexenhammer 666. Even the Marxist paradigm of a revolution, 
against the system of capitalism has become hopelessly obsolete because the workers can no longer blackmail the system by withholding their labor from it because the latter is by and large no longer needed. It has long since been handled by automation. In the 16th and final chapter, we find that the death drives destruction of meaning without any creative libido to generate a phallic a replacement for it is something which can be observed easily in both the anarchists and also in the ISL movements, which simply destroy without even trying to build up anything to replace it. But both of these actually do stem from the Rousseauian fantasy of having a nostalgic return to the conditions in which our own self-love could be achieved without any barriers, which was, of course, the hope of crawling back into a second womb. Rousseau's theory is that we're unhappy in civilization because... In that world, our self-love has to be mediated through the eyes of others. But this myth of a noble savage world without alienation only drives us to become more resentful, which is why it's no coincidence that the only theory left today is critical theory, despite the fact that there's nothing left to critique. Somehow, we just keep deconstructing until there's nothing left to deconstruct except deconstructivism itself, which is just the expression of the pseudo-breast of the Matrix and the death drive of the Mortito, with no phallic meaning or libido remaining. A more meaningful distinction, though, was given by Durkheim. The attitude towards society only becomes more nihilistic as one perceives society to function more mechanically and less organically. This is particularly bad when AI comes to literally function autonomously without any organic biological component. The result, though, might be an absolutely nihilistic retreat into the pseudo-womb uh, and the desire to unbirth oneself through the death drive without phallic meaning, but the alternative under these conditions is far more promising. That is the promise of creating God in the internet age, but for that we have to go to Bard and Soderquist's other book, Syntheism, as we will do in the next video. So this is, once again, a lot of fun to discuss. I really hope you'll go out and get a copy of the book. A link is provided in the description. And uh, once again, thank you, uh, Bard and Soderquist, for writing this. It was an absolute pleasure to read and to discuss.